morning. Welcome to the service. We're glad you're here tonight. I'm glad you made it back out. Take your hymnal and turn to 308. 308, nothing but the blood. I'll let you remain seated. And we'll sing the first, the last, and or the first, the second, and the last. 308, nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Very good. Right across the page, 309, there is a fountain filled with that precious blood of Jesus. We'll sing the first, the fourth, and the last. Stanzas as one, four, and five. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that blood lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunged beneath that flood Lose all their guilty stains on the fourth. Ere since by faith I saw the stream Thy flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme And shall be till I die. And shall be till I die, and shall be till I die. Redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die. When this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. Amen. It's great to see everybody back again this evening. It's a pleasure to have met Brother Ed and Miss Wanda. They are missionaries to Africa. In just a few minutes, I'm going to let uh, Brother Ed come up and tell us about his ministry over there, getting Bibles to the folks there in Africa. And that's, a, that's definitely a much needed ministry. And we're looking forward to hearing more about that. Great service this morning. Looking forward to hearing what the Lord has for us this evening. Let's go ahead and pray and we'll begin our service. Father, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for 
the fountain, Lord, the blood that You spilled for us so that we can have eternal life, so that we can have forgiveness of our sins. Father, I know um, a lot of folks try to downplay the, uh, the blood. They try to downplay the sacrifice that You made for us. But Lord, that's, that's the reason we're redeemed. And Lord, help us always to be thankful and to uh, really stand in awe of what You did for us. Father, we pray that you be with us now as we worship you tonight, as we turn to your word, as we study and as we learn and grow and help us become more like you as a result of being here tonight. First in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go ahead. 297 in your hymnal, 297. Four good verses here. Are you washed in the blood? So what I want us to do is we'll sing verse one and verse two, and then we'll sing the chorus and then we'll sing stanzas three and four and then the chorus. So just the chorus after the second and the last stanza. But let's go ahead and stand. We'll begin on that first stanza and then go right back to the second stanza, all right? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? On the second. Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansions bright and be washed in the blood of the Lamb on the last? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Will be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. All right. A couple of announcements real quick. Don't forget, uh, if you're going to the DR with us, I think we may have a couple of them here. Don't forget that we need to get the money in as quickly as possible so I can get everything transferred over to Brother Ronnie and get ready for our mission trip heading down there. I know that's going to be a blessing. I know a lot of folks have come up and, and there's a lot of excitement about this trip. So please be praying for the folks that are going on that. Be pre- uh, praying for the kids and the teenagers and the adults that we'll have a chance to minister to, to down there. We're all, I know we're going to have a great time. We do need a couple of things if you uh, think about it. Uh, we need a bunch of small toys, you know, like the kinds you get at the Dollar Tree. You know, yeah, you can get a, a big pack of like those little small bouncy balls, uh, little matchbox cars, things like that, stuff that we can hand out to the kids and use for prizes. Um, along with that, some uh, basketballs, um, uh, concrete type soccer balls, outside playing balls. I think he said no dot, you know, like the dodgeballs, like what we use. I think those are too easy to tear up. I guess these kids are really tough on on balls. So we need to make sure things that's going to last. So anyway, if you can think about it, when you're going through Walmart, uh, Sam's Club, or any of the stores around here, and you pass by that sports aisle, just grab a basketball or grab one of those things and bring it in. We'll make sure. I'd love to to pack one one suitcase at least full of those types of things that we can hand out to the uh, to the kids down there. Uh, thank you so much for the for the uh, great turnout for our fundraiser dinner today. It was a blessing and uh, great fellowship too. And I know the kids, we've raised quite a bit of money so far. I'm going to let Brother Brian tell you more about that here in a little bit. But, uh, but this is all helping kids get to camp. And uh, that can be a life-changing experience for some of these teenagers. So uh, thank you so much for your, for, your, um, uh, for your ability to be able to do that. Also, uh, like I said earlier, VBS is coming up and they're needing some things for the craft. Miss Beverly is doing that again this year. And she's, uh, one of the things she's doing is, you know, those old milk crates. So she's got a bunch of milk crates and they're going to be decorating them. And she needs one inch wide, y'all, ladies, y'all know what I'm talking about. One inch wide ribbon. 
Y'all know what I'm talking about? Because I have no idea what we're talking about there. But that's what she needs is one inch ribbon. I guess they're going to decorate the outside of there. So if you have any of that ribbon uh, hanging around, we could use that. And also, I don't know how you drink your milk and your orange juice and your lemonade, but uh, I normally use those plastic gallon jugs. That's what I just, I guess I, we drink a lot of it. But if you use those small cardboard, you know, the orange juice cardboard ones, I don't know, there's a half gallons or that she has, she has quart here. So I guess it's a quart. Anyway, if you use those, don't throw them away. Bring them in. She can use those for part of Matter of fact, until now, BBS, let's start drinking out of those because I don't normally. So I guess we're going to start buying those until BBS. But let's start using those so we can bring them in and we can use them for the VBS crafts. And be pl please be praying for VBS. Y'all know that's a huge outreach here. It is a blessing to see this auditorium filled with kids. Brother Brian has some great um, some great ideas this morning or this evening. Just before you showed up, he was uh, talking about doing uh, this uh, pre-service type program. And but when he's telling me about this skits and, and games and these things, he didn't say VBS. I thought he was talking about the services. And I'm like, so you want to start doing like a pre-service skit for the church? All right. So tell me a little bit more about this. What, what are we talking about? So he was talking about VBS. So we're safe. Don't worry about any of that. But anyway, that's going to be a blessing. Like I said, be praying for these kids. Um, Y'all know my background in BBS. That was my only, only time we went to church growing up. And I can still remember some of the things that those ladies taught us uh, and the crafts that we did. My mom still has those crafts in her china cabinet. That, that was only about 10, 15 years ago. So that wasn't that long ago. But anyway, she still has all of those. Uh, but it's a blessing. So please be praying for these kids. Be praying for the teachers. Also, like Brother Brian said this morning, um, if you didn't fill out the form, you don't have a job yet. But we still need you. So please take that form. Fill it out. Tell, me where, tell us where you would like to serve so we can plug you into a ministry. And uh, I know everybody will have a great time during that week. Let's see. Anything else? Oh, yeah. Gentlemen, don't forget, Saturday morning, uh, we'll be at the... Uh, What's that place? Cracker Barrel on Watson, right across, uh, right, right there near Lowe's and all that for our men's prayer breakfast. Of course, we're going to eat, fellowship, have a great time, and uh, looking forward to that as well. So guys, don't forget, market calendars, 8 o'clock, Cracker Barrel and, and Warner Robins, and looking forward to that. All right, I think that's all the announcements I need to make. So gentlemen, come forward. Time to take up our evening offering. Visitors, thank you so much for being with us. If you uh, filled out that visitor's card, if you'll place it in the offering plate as it goes, comes by, um, that's really all we ask from you. Uh, we just want you to stay in here, enjoy being being part of our service. Our church does a great job at taking care of our financial obligations here. We just want to make sure that you enjoy the service, and we thank you for coming and worshiping with us today. Brother Vern, good to see you, man. You feeling better? Praise the Lord. We've been praying for you and your bride, and we'll continue to pray for you all. Will you please pray for our evening offering? Amen. <clears throat> Crazy noise coming from up here. Apparently, when you're into a song, don't tap your Apple Watch because then it pings your phone somehow. I don't know how that worked. But uh, all right. Well, Brother Ed, why don't you come up and tell us a little bit about what the Lord's doing with you guys down in Africa. If you take about two, three minutes and just let us know what the Lord's leading you guys to do. No problem. Yes, sir. Uh, let me just say... Um, 
almost eight years ago, not quite eight years ago, the Lord, uh, we were on our way to start a, a fundamental New Testament church in uh, Gainesville, Florida, and God stopped me dead in the tracks and told me he had something else he wanted me to do. After working 42 years uh, in church planning here in America, uh, we started out in Germany, started our first church in Heilbronn, Germany, back in 1969. That's uh, long time ago. <laughs> and uh, But God uh, spoke to our heart, and and uh, he uh, told me what he wanted me to do. And I went to Africa seven years ago, and uh, uh, I came back. My wife said, what in the world happened to you in Africa? And I says, come and see. She came and saw, and she's been back ever since. But I want to say the first year I went, I was preaching at a mission conference, and I had a man that came forward, a tribe leader from Sudan, and uh, he's uh, Pastor George, uh, the national over there that was a host pastor there. There was 177 na national missionaries from four different countries that were there in a the meeting. But the one from Sudan came, and he says, I want you to understand what he's doing. He presented me with his staff, and he says, Brother Stanley, would you go back to America? Will you hold his staff up for Sudan, for Kenya, and for all of Africa? and be our voice in America. What we do is we come back here to America. I, I uh, went to them and asked what their greatest need was, and above all the needs that they asked for, it was for Bibles. They wanted the same book that made America great. And I came back here to America, and I says, I don't know how in the world I'm going to do it, but I says, I'm going to try and uh, do my best to help them out with some Bibles. And I was thinking about just a, a few Bibles in that, and we were at a mission conference. I had a Bible and printing company came to me and said, Brother Stanley, what can we do to help you? We're a Bible printing company, Bible literature, missionary foundation, Shelbyville, Tennessee. And uh, he said, what can we do to help you? I said, I need Bibles. And he, he says, give me a few minutes. He went and talked to his dad on the phone, came back and said, you got 30,000 King James Bibles. All you got to do is give them to Africa. Amen. And so I came back and I said, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Well, he says, don't worry, I'll take care of everything. He says, here's what I want you to do. Woke me up one night, the middle of the night, and he says, this is what I, I want you to do. He says, I want you to go to my churches, I want you to go to my pastors, and I want you to tell them what I want in Africa. And he says, I promise you, I'll supply everything that you have need of. Now, this, this was uh, seven years ago, and God has supplied everything we have need of. We have right now four containers of 30,000 by 120, total of 120,000 King James Bibles on the ground that's already been passed out in Africa. We have another 30,000 on the way to Ghana as we speak. And I, I want to tell you, we're literally seeing thousands upon thousands of people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. We're working with national pastors, national churches over there, challenging them to keep moving forward with the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, spreading the good news. And they're asking all over Africa for Bibles. My wife says, you better not take that church. <laughs> They'll think you got a building. <laughs> no, it just, it blessed my heart. 400 miles. Can you imagine to present, Pastor, to present this? And said, will you be our voice in America? So that's what we've tried to do. We're seeing multitudes of souls come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what, what, what we're asking uh, tonight as we go into churches, we're not asking for, for money from you. What we're asking for is, is just God said he had burdened the hearts of people. I have a doctor in our church has given over $50,000 to help us get Bibles to Africa and to help the nationals over there in their churches, repairing buildings. And they don't have buildings like us. They have mud huts and things. But uh, we've been able to do a lot over there, buy sheet metal for roofs. You pray for us. We go back this time. We're going back with a desire in our heart to put some wells in in Africa. And you say wells aren't important. Well, I'll tell you, you put a well in, you win the hearts of a whole city to the Lord. They'll come because you're trying to give them what they need most. Because I'll tell you, they're carrying around these jugs of, of so-called water. It looks like orange Kool-Aid. They drink that every day. They wash in it. They they cook in it. I mean, it's it's uh, it's junk. And we're trying to give them something back and give them at least a chance like we've had in America. So you pray for us, if you will. But we're taking the King James Bible. And I tell everybody everywhere I go, these Bibles, for, for what you pay for one cup of coffee here in America, we can put three Bibles in the hands of African people. And so you pray for us. Like I say, we've got 150,000. When that container reaches the ground, we'll have 150,000. King. You know what that is? Think in your minds just for a minute. That's almost $1 million 
of Bibles in Africa because of the partnership of churches and the partnership of Bible Literature Missionary Foundation. It's made it all possible. So you pray for us if you will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Brother, I would never say a well is a is an unimportant thing. Christ used a well to to show a show a uh, a woman her need of salvation, didn't he? And uh, praise the Lord, brother. We'll be praying for you. Thank you so much for coming by and worshiping with us today. Amen. We did talk about that this morning, didn't we? About how much this this book is worth. Well, I think we uh, we undervalue it too many times. Uh, it's a lot. I think I don't know how much a Thompson chain reference is. That's what I've got in front of me, but it's worth a whole lot more than whatever that shelf price was on it. That's for sure. All right, take your Bibles tonight. Go to Acts chapter nine. We're st- yes, we are still in Acts chapter nine. We've been in there for a little while, um, and uh, I think this is the last message in Acts chapter nine. We'll we'll see, but I think so. A man named Rich Stearns said, uh, said he had an idea, called it the domino theory of spiritual impact. He said, imagine a long line of dominoes. When one falls, it starts a chain reaction that can cause dozens or hundreds more dominoes to fall. For instance, Jesus set up 12 dominoes, his disciples, mentored them, empowered them with the Holy Spirit, and then sent them off to go and do likewise. Now there are over 2 billion followers of Christ in the world. That's a lot of dominoes. Thank you, baby. Stearns provides the following story about the spiritual impact that one person can have. In the 1880s, Robert Wilder, a missionary kid from India, was preparing to return to the mission field. During college, he even signed a pledge along with his friends to become a missionary. But because he was so physically frail, he never fulfilled that pledge. Instead, he encouraged others to take up the task. One domino fell. During a preacher preaching tour that took Robert through Chicago, he spoke to an audience that included Samuel Moffat. Samuel also signed Robert's pledge, and within two years, he landed in Korea. Another domino fell. A few years later, Samuel shared the gospel with one, with a man who had become disillusioned with the Taoist practice. Kael Sun, Sun Chu trusted Christ, and quickly, another domino fell. In 1907, Kiel was one of the leaders of the Pyongyang Revival. In January of that year, spontaneous prayer and confession broke out during a regular church meeting. Thousands of dominoes fell. Those days of fervent prayer are now considered the birth of an independent, self-sustaining Korean church. When Kiel died in 1935, 5,000 people attended his funeral. The church in Korea were uh, the church in Korea now numbers about 15 million. Stands more foreign, says more foreign missionaries than any other country outside of the United States. Millions of dominoes continue to fall. As Christians, we are all dominoes in a chain reaction set off by Jesus 2,000 years ago. The amazing thing about dominoes falling is that the chain reaction always starts small with just one seemingly insignificant domino. Whether you are sponsoring a child, filling backpacks for children in inner city schools, taking on, taking, uh, talking to your own children, or praying earnestly for people around the globe, you have no idea how big the impact will be as God multiplies your faithfulness. Each one of us is a domino. Every one of us in here. The question is, are we willing to surrender our lives to allow our domino to fall? Are we willing to allow God to use the gifts that He has given us? And it doesn't matter if you're the youngest person in this room or the oldest person in this room. Every one of us can be used to impact those around us. I love watching those uh, competitions where they take those dominoes, you know what I'm talking about, where they set up millions of them, or I don't know how many. It seems like millions. But all of a sudden, one falls. And what happens if they did it right? Another one continues to fall. Then it just keeps going. It keeps going. And it keeps going. In Acts chapter 9, we read of a, we read of a lady by the name of Tabitha. It says, uh, verse 36, Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, when uh, whom 
when they had washed, they laid her in the upper chamber. And forasmuch as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him unto the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him, weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth, and kneeling down and prayed, and returned him to the body, uh, turned to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. This lady named Tabitha was known as a person who gave her life for her community, as a person who didn't mind being that domino that would fall. She did, she, what could she do? She was, I mean, it doesn't say, I'm assuming, based on what her situation she was in, she was either a, a widow or she was an older a lady who never married, didn't have a lot of money, didn't have a lot of, a lot of resources, but what she could do is make garments, and she did so. And in that little, what you would call insignificant in some ways, ministry, she touched the lives of so many people. You know, I think of my mom growing up and how she used to uh, make quilts. She had this quilting rack that she would, she would hang, in, and it would hang in, the, in the living room. And she would sit there and by the hour sew, sew these quilts. Ladies do that and then they give those things away. I have one in my office right now that was given to me by a lady who was part of the Wounded Warrior Project. She wanted to uh, show, now don't get me wrong, I don't consider myself deserving of this by any stretch of the imagination, but because I served in Iraq, she wanted to make sure I got one. And it's hanging, well, it's not hanging in my office, it will be as soon as I figure out that little contraption that you're supposed to hang on your wall to hang a quilt. But it's in my office. She wanted to make sure that, she couldn't do much, but she could quilt. And she wanted to make sure that that quilt got into the hands of someone who, who would understand her appreciation. Of what she did. See, that was Tabitha's ministry. See, that's where there's no insignificant ministry. There isn't. Miss Molly being able to play the piano a while ago, Miss Linda playing the piano, John and, and Justin up in the sound booth, uh, Seth running the camera, the folks that just took the offering, the, the folks back, back here uh, keeping nursery, the, the people that are going to be volunteering for VBS, whether you're cleaning the floor or whether you're teaching the lesson or whether you're doing the skit, it doesn't matter. There is no insignificant ministry. God can use you as that next domino that will cause the next one to fall. The question are, is, are you willing to be that domino? So tonight I'm going to pray and then we're going to begin our message on the domino effect. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. Pray that you help us as we as we study this concept, as we study what it means to allow you to use the gifts, the talents, the life that you've given us. God, I pray that you convict every heart in here, including mine, of the times that we have failed to be used by you. And Lord, give us a new desire, a new passion to do the things that will impact the world around us with your gospel. Thank you so much for this time that we have. We ask that you bless it now. For Christ, let me pray. Amen. So the very first point is you have to be willing to be that first domino. Nobody, nobody likes to be the first, right? Nobody likes to be, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know I remember in, um, in basic training, <laughs> when, um, when we were going through, I mean, food time was my favorite time. Because at that point, well, first off, I, I don't know if the food was just really good or I was just really hungry. So for those of you guys here in the Air Force, you know what I'm talking about. That food was good for the Army and Marines. Sorry, you guys. Y'all probably weren't anywhere near like what we had, but we had good food. But I remember when we would go through the, the line, we'd have our, man, we, they would fill our plates up. And then there was this one rack of cakes that nobody was brave enough to touch. Not one of us. We were scared. To, well, we were getting yelled at for everything. We were getting, if we looked the wrong way, we got yelled at. If we didn't have our hat on at the exact time that the TI thought we should have our hat, we were getting yelled at. We got yelled at a lot. So nobody was going to, nobody wanted to be that first person until this one, one guy. His name was Horowitz. 
I don't remember his first name, but his last name was kind of hard to forget. His little his little short guy had a huge nose, but his name was Horowitz. And he, he like turned into our mascot after this day because we're sitting there. I mean, we're double fist. We're shoveling it in. They only give you like two minutes to eat a full plate of food. So you're shoveling it in as fast as you could. Next thing you know, Horowitz gets up and goes to the cake tray. And we all stopped and watched. We're like, oh, he's going to get it. He's going to get it. You just wait. They're going to yell at him. And he got his cake and came back down and sat back down and started eating his cake. Nothing happened. And we all looked at each other. <gasps> we can get cake. Next thing you know, every one of us jumped up and we headed there and we sold out the entire cake thing. I and mean, we were just shelling it. We probably had this the worst sh sugar high we had had in our entire life from eating this cake because we hadn't had sweets for a long time. All of a sudden, this one guy was that first domino to fall, and we were like, yes, and every one of us fell right in behind him. We don't like to be that first guy. We don't like to be that first lady. But it's required. Somebody's got to be the one that stands up and says, I'm the one that's going to, I'm the one that's going to start this. I'm the one that has to get this ball rolling. Um, Matthew chapter 6 verse 19 through 24, tells us that to be that first domino, first off, we've got to change our focus. There's some things we, ha we have to get our minds off of us. I know I say that an awful lot. But you know why I say that so much? Because I know where my focus is, and my focus is on me. I love me. I, 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 I like to take care of me. You, we spend time in the mirror looking before church. Why? Because I love me. I was talking at Jonathan Culverhouse. I was going to pick on him tonight, but he's not here. He's like, no, I look at the mirror because I love you guys, and you don't need to see what I look like if I haven't looked in the mirror. So, Jonathan, if you're watching, there you go. That's my, I'm tipping my hat to you, brother. But we have to learn to change our focus. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24, Scripture says this, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust nor doth corrupt, and there where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is telling his followers, he says, listen, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be that next domino, you've got to change your focus. We get so caught up with how much money we make, with what kind of car we drive, with what kind of house we live in. We get so caught up with our comfort that we forget everything you have right now, everything is going to pass away one day. You don't take any of it with you. Job said, naked I came into this world, naked will I leave this world. Nothing you have right now will leave with you. What legacy are you going to leave for those who followed you? What legacy did Tabitha leave? They were showing Peter, weren't they? Look at the garments she made for me. And you know what those garments represented? All of Tabitha's wealth. Everything that she had. She gave to those people. I think it's time as a church. We quit worrying about building our own kingdoms and build His kingdom. It's time as a church that we forget worrying about keeping up with the Joneses, which we all do, and worry more about whose life you're going to be able to impact when you decide to allow God to use it. You have to change that focus. If you're going to be willing to, if you're going, willing to be that first domino, number one, you got to change that first focus. Or that focus. Matthew chapter 19, verse 21 says, Jesus said unto them, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. I told y'all this was the rich young ruler who came to Christ and said, what do, what do I need to earn eternal life? And what did Jesus say? He wasn't lying to him. He said, what can I do that I may earn eternal life? Well, to earn eternal life, the only way to do it is to live a perfectly holy life. He said, well, you know what Scripture says. Don't steal. Don't kill. Don't, don't lie. Don't do any of those. You know, don't you know, Keep the commandments. Keep the Word of God completely. What did he say? I've done all of those from my youth. Well, number one, he just lied. So that's sin number one. 
But you know what's awesome? In the book of Mark, has it has the same passage. Jesus didn't say, you know what? Wait a second. Let's talk about your sin life now. He didn't bring it up. It says that Jesus loved him. And that's when he says this. Go and sell everything you've got. If you want to have treasure in heaven, you've got to let go of this world. You've got to let go of your own. Does that mean that I'm asking you guys to go and clean out your bank accounts and and give it away? That's, That's not what I'm saying. Please don't get me wrong. But don't let those things control you. Mr. Um, Howells Anderson, the Anderson side of Howells Anderson, I got a chance to meet him one day. He a uh, very rich man, very well at investing. He's got like a home in Fiji and a home in Tahiti, and he's got homes everywhere. But you know what he would do every summer? According to Mr. Anderson, every summer he would pay a college student a full salary to do nothing but stand in the park and hand out Bible tracts. He paid many men's, young men's way through college because he was able to. He used the money that God had given him to impact the lives of many. He was willing to be that domino. We have to learn to change our focus. We have to learn to get our mind off of what we have. It's like the, the, uh, there was a father who gave his little girl uh, two, uh, a couple of dollars. He said, uh, you can do anything you want with one of the dollars, but the other dollar belongs to God. So she was so excited. I remember when I got my first dollar, I was picking up, picking up a bunch of rocks in the backyard. Man, back then a dollar would buy a bag of candy. Y'all remember that? Buy a bag of candy. And man, I was looking for it. And that's where she was heading to. She had her $2 and she was cruising to, for us, it was Ringgold's. <laughs> she was cruising to Ringgold's. She was going to go fill up that bag. And on the way, she tripped and she fell. And one of the dollars fell down the, fell down the storm drain. She looked at that dollar and says, well, God, that one was yours. <laughs> she wasn't willing to let go of the other one, was she? How many of us are like that? Somebody told me this the other day. They said, if God were to take what you put in the offering plate and multiply it by 10, could you live on that? That's hitting close to home. (laughs) It's true, though. John Wesley said this, do all the good you can by all the means you can and all the ways you can and all the places you can and all the times you can to all the people you can as 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 long as ever you can. He was saying, spend your life on something that matters. Get your focus right. So the next thing we're going to talk about is there's some rewards for this. When we decide that we're going to surrender completely to God, there are some rewards. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1-4 through says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when, you do thou, uh, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy le- left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Thine, uh, and uh, that thine alms may be in secret, and the Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. When we preach through this one, we talk about alms as our giving, what we put in the offering plate. But the word alms means a lot more than that. Anytime you use the resources that God has given you to help someone else, that's alms. Anytime you use the money that God has given you to help someone that is in need, that is alms. Christ is telling the folks here, listen, if you want to be, if you want to really please God with what you do, with the resource that He gives you, you don't tell everybody about it. I love the fact He says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. In other words, it should be something between you and God and you and God alone. That's when you know you're setting up your treasure in heaven. When you're willing to be that domino, and to fall and to let God have all of your resources so that your life can impact the lives of many. You don't trumpet that, trumpet that out. You don't, you, you don't brag about it. You don't send a bugle in front of you and tell everybody, look how great I am. No, it's between you and God. In Matthew chapter 12, I don't, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read the whole passage, but this is when the poor, poor widow woman came at the, she was right there. She, all the, uh, 
uh, Pharisees and everybody was putting their their stuff in the in the basket there outside. I don't know if they had a basket or whatever. Well, anyway, they were g- giving all the all the money there at the at the temple. And then you had this widow that came up with her alms. I know I've got another domino in one of these pockets. <laughs> she came up with her alms and she put it in the basket. And what happened? Jesus saw her. And it says, and he called unto his disciples. <laughs> imagine this for a second. Just put yourself into this position. Okay? Just imagine you're, you're there. Jesus, God, has just watched what you put in the offering plate. That's exactly what happened here. And he called all of his disciples over and says, hey, everybody, y'all come look at this. And he used her as an example of what giving is all about. Look at what he says. He says, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. You see, when Tabitha gave what she gave as far as her life goes, what she gave while she lived was all she had. And look at how that impacted the lives of those around us. She turned out to be a testimony to every one of us. You didn't hear her trumpeting, did you? I can almost in my mind's eye, I can see. Honestly, so so, um, I I love Miss Ruth. I do. I do. Miss Ruth, she's such an awesome lady. But I, I, in my mind, I imagine Miss Ruth walking up to the temple. You know, kind of bent over from age the way she is and, and dropping everything she's got into there. That's hard, isn't it? Because we don't want to let go. It's kind of like the old joke. You ever seen the guy that used to, they, he'd give money and he have a string attached to it. So they, I don't know if people think people do that anymore, but, you know, they'd put the dollar in the pocket. He'd snatch the string back and hold on to it. It's hard to give sometimes, especially when we're holding on to it too tight. But there are rewards when we do. James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6 says, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver are cankered, and the rest of them which shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. He's saying, listen, those of you who have decided I'm going, th- I'm going to put everything I can into my comfort in this life, he said, this is vanity. It's useless. If you're going to enjoy the rewards that God has for you, you've got to change your focus. You've got to get your mind off of you. Washington, there was a guy in Washington, or well, up in Washington, I guess one of his monuments, uh, there was some uh, graffiti found on one of his statues. You know, graffiti's changed a lot over the years, right? Now it's, you know, some gang sign, this pretty color or whatever it is they do on this. This was the graffiti they found on one of his statues. It says, whoever in the human instrument, whoever is the human instrument under God in the conversion of one soul erects a monument in his own memory more lofty and enduring than this. That's what the graffiti says. Saying every, all the great things that Washington did. If you... Invest your life into one lost soul. You have a monument greater than the one that represents the first president of the United States. And that's true. Think about the worth of one soul. Brother Ed, that was an awesome testimony to see so many souls saved as a result of getting the Word of God in their hands. I told you all this morning, I have 10 Bibles in my office, brother. I have one for every occasion. I have one by my nightstand. I have one by my recliner. I've got one in my truck. I've got one in my flight bag. I've got one. I've got one for everything that I do. Really, I do it because I want to make sure that no matter where I'm at, I've got a Bible to read. But there are people in Africa that don't have one. What are you willing to do about that? What am I willing to do about that? This fine couple right here has decided they're going to devote the rest of their lives to this. There are rewards for that. We are heaping up treasure in heaven according to Scripture. 
There are things that we can look forward to if we just get our minds off of what we're doing right now. So what are the results? And then we're done. What are the results? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17-19 through 19 says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may hold a lay hold of eternal life. So you've got the results of, of the rewards that you have in heaven, but also of those whose lives you have impacted through what you've done. People are watching. They truly are. They want to see. They've heard about this love of Christ. They've heard about this love that sent Christ to the cross so that he, they could have forgiveness of sins, but they want to see it in your life. They want to see you model it. They want to see you show them through your life how much God loves them. Let me ask you this. If someone were to look at your life, could they say, if God loves me as much as this person loves me, then I want to know more about Him. Would they? That's laying up treasure. That's the results. That's what Tabitha spent her, her, her life doing as a disciple. She didn't have much. She wasn't some great orator. She wasn't some awesome preacher like Peter and Paul and, and, uh, and, and John and these guys. She was, all she was was a seamstress. She could make clothes. But she used that. And the results were when she was on her deathbed when she was there dead and gone what did peter see they didn't talk they didn't it was well, they were weeping and wailing but why because someone who had done so much for them was gone she invested her life into them see that's what the domino effect does in our lives when we decide that we're going to follow him and allow us to fall that next domino falls that next domino falls that next domino Falls. I think you're. I think you would be surprised to learn how much your life impacts the life of those around you. Every one of us. People watch us. They want to see if what we have is real. One guy wrote this. He said, "A dollar spent for lunch lasts five hours. A dollar spent for neckties lasts five weeks. My necktie lasts longer than five weeks, but that's okay." A dollar spent for a cap lasts five months. That's about right for me. A dollar spent for an auto lasts about five years. A dollar spent for a railroad lasts five decades. A dollar spent in God's service lasts for eternity. There was a man named Paul Meyer. He wrote that when he, uh, when he got home one day, he found that his, uh, that his mother had passed. When, he, when they were looking at her belongings, they found in the apron that she was wearing one note that said this, S.S. Hope, seven miles, seven cents. Now, this was an elderly lady. She was probably, I'm, I'm, from what I understand about this lady, she was in her 80s or so. And he knew what that letter meant. See, they were raising money for this, for this medical ship called the S.S. Hope. They were raising money to get those medical supplies and, the, and the, the doctors and the nurses to the mission field so they could help others with their health. And he knew what this meant. His mom, his 80-year-old mom, had spent her last moments walking down the road rate seven miles to raise seven cents for that ship to be able to sail. She spent her last breath on others. When we give, when we surrender, when we allow God to use our lone, solitary life, we're like this domino. Every one of us. And I don't know where you are in that line of dominoes, but every one of us is like this domino. The question is, are we going to be like Tabitha? And allow the gifts that God has given us, the talents that God has given us, the resources that God has given us to impact the lives of Byron, Georgia. To impact the lives of our co-workers, 
to impact the lives of the folks in Africa who desperately need the Word of God. We're just one domino. But when that one domino decides, I am going to use my life, I am going to use everything God has given me to glorify Him, to impact the lives of others, it impacts everybody in line. I don't know where you are this morning in that line. I know where I am. And I know how often I fail. I know how often my focus gets on me. Now how often I want to keep as much as I can for myself and grudgingly let go of the stuff that I want to give rather than surrendering it all. I don't care where you are. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how, how your health is. Every one of us in here can do something. When you are there, or actually one day, when you're here, and you're laying in a box, and your family's here surrounding you and crying. You've got friends here. What are they going to be saying about you? What's your epitaph going to read? Are you going to have folks gathered around showing the fruits of your surrender, the impact that you made in their lives? That's what a lasting legacy is. That's what we should be striving to do. That's the monument we should be building with our lives. It is my prayer for my life that I surrender completely and say, God, here am I. Whatever you want, I'm willing. Use me. And that's, I pray that that's your goal for your life as well. As Miss Molly comes up for a brief time of invitation, I want to ask you this morning, or this evening, are you willing to be that domino? Are you willing to be that first one in the line that says, God, I'm yours. Use me. And then sit back and watch as God impacts the lives of those around you. Are you willing to be that domino? As Miss Molly begins to play, if everyone please stand with heads bowed and eyes closed. The altar is open if you want to come forward and pray. Whatever God is dealing with in your heart right now, don't ignore that. Allow Him to use it to rekindle that desire, to rekindle that passion in your life if you've lost it, to give you direction, to help you decide, I want to be that domino. I'm willing to surrender it all for the sake of the gospel. As Miss Molly plays through one more verse, I'm going to be quiet and let you do business with God this evening. Ask God to show you how He can use you to impact the lives of those around you. give everybody's attention just for one moment. Great to see everybody again tonight. Uh, make sure you come by and meet Miss Wanda and Brother Ed and encourage them as they uh, go out and do what the Lord has called them to. And to see the other visitors here, it's great to have you, Brother Vern, with us today. I'd like to get to know you here in just a few minutes. And great to see everybody else here this evening. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll close our service. Don't forget Wednesday, uh, Wednesday normal service. And, uh, of course, our kids will be doing their end-of-the-year party, so be praying for that as well. All right, Brother Harry, would you please close us in prayer this evening?
Amen.